Hi, it's time for another chime video. And I thought I would do a video about this chime bass because this is different than all of the other chime bass videos I've made so far. And while it has many similarities to the chime bass repair I did in, from a chime from the mid 80s and some similarities to the chime bass I did from 1961, it has almost no similarities to the 1947 chime bass. But the fundamental difference between this one and the other ones is that this is a much later one. This particular, this is from an LD49N and it was, this chime bass is dated 1995. So this is after Newtone made a fundamental change in their chime bass designs and gone are the Telecron clock motor and circuit board with mechanical parts and this is a fully electronic eight note chime bass. So it's a very different animal than the mechanical ones. An LD49 does have the type of decorative cover that goes over it. It has these plastic sort of faux stained glass panels in it and these lights light up and glow through the cover which actually makes it look pretty nice. We've got one bulb missing right here. When I do the repair on this, I will replace all of the light bulbs. One of the things I'll point out now, since we're talking about light bulbs for a second, is uh, all Newtone chimes that have the wedge type bulbs, which I would say start in the, I think it's the late 1970s or so, they're all miniature bulb number 259s, and they are what are called a wedge style bulb. They're not threaded and they're not bayonet mount, they're just a little wedgy end of glass with the leads bent over and they just push into the sockets. These bulbs are all wired in series. And what that means to you is that these are like the old fashioned Christmas tree lights that, I, that we had when I was a kid growing up where if one bulb goes out, burns out, all bulbs go out along with it. And in this case, we have a missing bulb, which means that since this one is missing, nothing will light up. All the bulbs have to be good. If you have one of these and the bulbs don't light up anymore, the first thing you should do is just simply replace the bulbs. They're not terribly expensive and you can actually order them on Amazon nowadays and they come in, in packs of, I think you can buy them individually or in boxes of like 10. So, you know, it's well worth having and that way you have spares for when they burn out. One of the things I'm not going to do in this video is I'm not going to go through the steps of showing you how to clean the plunger assemblies which I've shown in all of the other videos and they're all it's all fundamentally the same. These solenoid assemblies are exactly the same as the ones in the chime base video from 1985 and it would be the exact same steps of disassembling the 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 rubber cap on the back, removing the, pl the solenoid plunger and the spring, cleaning the inside of the bore. In this case, because it's not very old, I think just a little bit of lighter fluid and a little bit of um, towel action will clean them up. They don't seem to be stuck at all right now, so that's more general service. But I've showed that in th the three other videos in great detail. So if you need to clean the solenoid assemblies in your chime, please watch one of the other videos. The point of this video is to talk about this circuit board right here. While this is a fully electronic design, the wiring connections are the same as any other four wire, eight note long tube chime. You have our screw wire connections here across the top and they're labeled on the cardboard insulator cover. This one is common and then we have transformer and then we have side, rear, and front. And if you need to know how to hook this up, you can watch the video I made about how to wire a four wire, eight note long tube chime base because it takes you through it in great detail. And if you follow along with the video, you can hook it up yourself. There is a volume adjustment down here. It's, there's a cutout in the cardboard cover and then there's an adjustment pot on the board and you can adjust it from soft to loud and what you're doing by adjusting this is you're changing the amount of voltage that the solenoids receive, therefore adjusting how hard the plungers pop out and hit the tubes. And that's really all there is. So let's take a look at what's under the cover. Oh, and there is also a 
eight or four note selector switch. It shows here in the diagram on the cardboard cover. It's eight notes in the top position and four notes in the bottom. And the switch is accessed through this little cutout right here. And you just need a screwdriver and you can flip the switch up or down depending on how you want it to ring. So if we go ahead and remove the cardboard cover, this is usually held on to the, to the solder side of the circuit board. Usually it just has some double-sided tape on it. It's kind of sticky, so it comes off readily easily. And then what we're looking at here is we're looking at the back of the circuit board. There are no mechanical parts on here that make it activate. The selector switch and the volume control are mechanical parts, but we're not counting those. We're talking about what makes the chime ring. This was sent in by a customer from Indiana, and the information that came along with it was the chime doesn't work. So we're going to take a look at it and see if we can figure out why that is. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to remove the screws that hold it to the base. And that would be the five screws for the common transformer side rear and front. And as always, good practice is, where do the screws go? If you watch my other chime videos, you know the answer. They go in the tin cup so we don't lose them. Uh, one thing I'll point out is, is on the circuit board, these screw connections or these wire connections across here, they are labeled. This one says common, TR is transformer, S is side, rear is R is rear, and F is front. So even if the cardboard cover is missing, you can still figure out which wires go where. So let's go ahead and turn this over. And if I have it turned upside down here, if we turn it over, we can look at the component side of the circuit board. One of the things that makes working on these a little bit challenging is all the little tiny hair size wires that are soldered to different connection points on the board that travel down to the solenoids underneath the chassis. So we don't really want to unsolder those if we don't have to. And usually there's enough slack that if you're a little bit careful, you can manipulate it around without having to do that. Let's go over what the board consists of a little bit, and then uh, we'll take a look at what the problems may be with it. The board is divided up into different sections. We have a power supply section here. Down here, we have the outputs that cause the solenoids to strike. So we have some output transistors and some supporting diodes and resistors down here. Here's our adjustable volume control pot. This is our four or eight note switch. And then what we have, the part of these that are the most important is this chip here. This is IC2. This is a decade counter. And down here we have IC1 and this is a Schmidt trigger. And these are the two chips that allow or cause the chime to function the way it does. And normally when these come in, the types of problems that they have revolve around either basic power supply problems because of the age of the chime. Although this one is only 22 years old or so, and I wouldn't expect power supply problems at this point, but it is a possibility. Sometimes what we find is when you have power supply problems, or if you live in an area that has lightning issues, sometimes if you have a lightning event in your area, the lightning can find its way to the chime base from the wiring on the exterior of your house that's connected to the push buttons, and that can cause the board to fail. So those are all likely possibilities. One of the things I see right off is this little interesting bit right here that obviously someone's had somewhat of a go at. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that and see what that's all about. So what we're looking at here in this corner of the board is it looks like we have D6, D7, and D8. These are all diodes and apparently something happened to D8 and you can see sort of the um, the remains of it here and here. The center part is sort of blown away. And that's the gap right there. You can sort of see the tan board between the two, two ends. And then someone very interestingly took another diode and instead of desoldering 
the blown up diode from the board completely and inserting the leads of the new diode through the board and soldering on into the back, which would be good workmanship. They decided to take the leads and blob some solder from the new diode leads onto the old diode leads and uh, this is all pretty horrible. So let's go ahead and take that off real quick. If we kind of melt this, we're going to push this aside because that's not really very acceptable. You know, th this is not how you fix things. This is just silly. If you're going to try to fix something yourself or if someone did this at a shop where you took it to them, they should be slapped. Uh, if you're a do-it-yourself or you're just playing around with it, I guess that's one way to go, but not really the right way to go. Uh, the thing about boards like this is, this is a pretty simple design. And if you're a uh, hobbyist or an enthusiast of electronics and you have a little bit of time and you have a little bit of equipment, it doesn't take too much to work on a board like this. Uh, for the most part, you know, if you have a decent multimeter, you can actually go through and test and measure almost all of the components on this board looking for a problem and then replace the components that you find that have failed and you have a pretty likely chance that you might be able to fix it. The equipment required to do it properly is not expensive although for a lot of people if you don't have any of the equipment it's easier just to send it in to get it fixed. The testing of the integrated circuits is not usually that necessary and one of the problems because if they're bad, you just replace it. We're talking about parts that cost, in one quantity, you might pay $2 a piece for them. So not very difficult to do. One of the things about working on a board like this is, like many Newtone products, especially in the mid-90s and later, unfortunately, there is no schematic for this. Newtone never actually published one. I think it was because it was considered to be a simple enough design that someone with the experience to do board level work could figure it out on their own. And as hard as I've looked and everywhere I've seen, I've never found a schematic for it. So there's a certain amount of experience that you gain in working on these. And if you haven't worked on one before, it's a little bit more of an uphill battle, but there isn't anything on this board that's terribly difficult to deal with. So if you're inclined to try, give it a shot. If you do that, please don't do this over here like this. That's just ridiculous. Blown up components should be removed and new components should be put back in their place properly with the right components. So, you know, come on guys. Anyway, I'm going to take a quick look at this and figure out what's up with it, see if I can get it repaired, and uh, the next time you'll see me, it'll probably work. Hi, I'm back. So let's take a look at our now repaired 1995 Newtone LD49N chime base and I'll try to explain to you what happened to it. So it was non-operational when it came in and you saw in the first part of the video someone sort of bodged in a diode over here on top of the one that had burnt in half. So in diagnosing the problem on the board this is what I found. This main capacitor right here the original one had failed and when it failed it failed open and when a capacitor fails open, it would be just like it wasn't there at all. You, it would have been the same as if you had snipped it and taken it out altogether. So this is the primary power supply capacitor and it has two jobs. One, it stores a little bit of energy in it so when other parts of the chime require a little extra energy, there's a reservoir that it can they can draw on and things work the way they're supposed to. The other function of this capacitor is it takes out waveforms that are in the DC power supply circuit. Uh, DC is supposed to be a nice long straight flat line, but without the necessary filtering capacitors you get a, wave, a slight waveform in it. That waveform is referred to as ripple and electronic components don't like ripple. Lots of different types really, really don't like it. And so with a essentially a missing capacitor because it had failed open, there was all sorts of wave uh, ripple waveforms throughout the circuit. 
and there was also no reservoir of power available when a device needed to draw on it. So then we have to look further down the circuit. So we have two integrated circuits. We have this one here, which is IC1, and this one here, which is IC2. IC1 is what's called a Schmidt trigger, and basically you can sort of think of it as an automatic switch. It, it's a trigger. It triggers it can trigger other components to become active and do things. This one up here, IC2, this is what's called a decade counter. And the decade counter is a lot like what it sounds like. It counts decades or tens, and it counts in tens. And the purpose of it is it's what gives the chime its rhythm or its cadence. It's what's responsible for the timing of how the solenoids strike and the pauses between the the strikes and those sort of things. So this is responsible for the rhythm of the chime. This is responsible for triggering the solenoids or triggering the components that trigger the solenoids so they fire and hit the tubes. Both of the original, these are replacements. Both, this one was damaged. This one was replaced as a good practice because with ripple in the circuit and if you have one bad IC you should definitely replace both of them because I don't want to see this board come back for another 20 years so while it's here let's just do it the right way the other thing I found which is a little was a little unusual which I don't usually see in the in in this version of chime with problems are down here along the bottom which is a little hard to see there are four fairly powerful transistors and these transistors are actually what switch on and cause the solenoids to energize and strike. Each one of these, or all four of them, were all burnt out. And you could actually see when, you, when I took them, the original ones off the board, they actually were discolored from heat. I believe the whole problem began with the failing of the capacitor and everything just went downhill from that point. This is not a terribly complicated board but it's always interesting to try to find the source of the problem and then make sure everything works correctly. As for why this diode over here actually failed, I don't really have a clue. It's in, in this part of the circuit that has to do with the push button for the rear door terminal and I couldn't find any real cause for why that would have failed. Perhaps it had failed because somebody was monkeying around with the board and these are glass diodes so they're little beads of glass with silicon inside of it and perhaps somebody was monkeying around with it trying to figure out what was wrong with it and they accidentally broke it because the center portion of the glass was actually missing. These can fail but they don't usually like explode and fall apart they just stop working so maybe that's a different cause. This could be like a red herring trying to figure out what's up with that when everything else is kind of obvious. So let's go ahead. I'm going to put this back together real quick and show you that it works. Okay, so here's our LD49N chime base. I have it hooked up to my bench power supply. You can see the four lights light up and I just have a, a wire connected as my temporary push button per se. And if we and your so your solenoids are down here on the bottom. And if you watch, we'll do the side door first, which is this one. And then the rear door, oops, wrong, wrong terminal. That was the front door. Rear door, which is this one. And then our eight note sequence. And we're in good working order. It's drawing the right amount of current and it was a successful and relatively straightforward repair to do. That's all for today. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you like our videos and you learn things from them, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have a new tone eight note, a long tube door chime, whether it's a mechanical version or an electronic version like this one, and you have problems with it, get a hold of us and I'll repair it for you. That's all for today. See you on the next video.